Good evening, everyone. Um, uh, it tonight is our uh, third uh, lecture on our second topic, uh, which is uh, animal health and welfare. Um, and um, tonight we are going to be looking at um, uh, uh, internal parasites. Um, and I think um, that you, you'll learn something. There's, there's a lot of farmers that do not understand how they work. And uh, after tonight, you'll be one of some of the few that actually does um, and so on. Okay, uh, so, so let me just switch that off. Let's see. Oh, why is that not disappearing? Oh, no. Oh, there we go. Okay, so uh, guys, so this is our uh, second topic, as I said. Um, and we've sort of done our duties of care, um, and we looked at the, the sort of the space requirements and things, trough space and designs and so on of our uh, uh, feed uh, of our uh, facilities and so on, um, which all goes towards uh, health and comfort and so on. Um, the next one is sort of uh, that uh, duty of care the, the, to to provide uh, provide them um, with with a, um, a healthy environment and so on. So internal, uh, so we, we're doing uh, internal parasites tonight. Um, also, we will talk about resistance to oral drenches uh, and so on. Biological control with measures that we can con use when the chemicals and so on fail us, and and they are. Uh, we'll talk about that just now. Uh, so, uh, and then there's the signs and symptoms of different uh, kinds of worms and and, and parasites, and. Um, uh, and then we're going to look at sort of new technologies that um, is sort of come on, on online in the last four or five years, basically. Um, okay, so let me just get rid of this. And okay, so uh, guys, tonight in under roundworms, we're going to look at your barber's pole. Now, the barber's pole is is most probably the uh, um, biggest problem in internal parasites and so on. They are blood sucking worm. Uh, they call the barber's pole. Now, uh, I don't know if the ladies know this, but the, the guys will. That um, outside of a men's barber shop, there's usually a, a red and white spiraling pole. That's sort of that our uh, guys uh, identify. Okay, there's a, a barber uh, that I can go and cut my hair with, and so on. Now, in the old days, um, the barber was also the the surgeon if your leg had to be amputated then you went to the to the to the barber and he, he had a sharp knife because you to shave you need a very sharp knife in those days and saws and so on so amputations major sort of operations and things was done by the barber um and so on and so he always had cloths covered in blood and he used to hang these sort of wash them and hang them outside of his shop to dry and it's sort of a spin off from that is the red and white barber's pole uh, on the outside of the uh, of a barber shop and so on and um yeah th these worms are visible in size uh, they sort of ranging between uh, sort of uh, one centimeter there two centimeters and, and uh, up to sort of three and a half centimeters for the bigger ones but they are visible with the naked eye you don't need a microscope to look at them and if you know where to look for them then you can actually see them and and yet if you see worms in a certain spot it's usually you can tell which worm it is because they live in different parts of this of the digestive system some live in the uh, rumen some live in the um, in the uh, omasin, some in the abomasin, some in the um, uh, small intestines, and so on. So if you see them, well, it's some some in the lungs, and then the the, the nasal bot lives in these uh, sinuses of the of the, the nose and so on. Um, and then you uh, uh, so we we look at these, and the other one we're gonna so these are all round worms. Then we can look at the flat worm or the tapeworm, and um, it's sort of where they. Fit found and a few interesting things about tapeworms and then your liver flukes uh, which is a flat little it looks like a small leaf sort of the size of a 10 15 20 cent piece um, and so on and they live in wet uh, waterlogged areas and their carriers are a, a small freshwater snails that carry that's the the horses that they ride on and so on but yeah we'll look at all of these uh, during the night so, guys, um, internal parasites is a massive problem worldwide. Um, it's, uh, New Zealand by themselves most probably spend a few million New Zealand dollars a year um, on 
uh, oral drenches to control internal parasites. Wor worldwide, most probably billions of dollars are spent on internal parasite control. And guys, the problem is that we are losing the battle uh, and so on. So, uh, firstly, because it takes it like 10 years to develop a new drench. Um, and with, before it does, it, of course, there need to be a need and if they need to make sure that yeah, they can make their money because they're spending billions of dollars before they launch it uh, and so on. Um, so it takes very long for us to get, come up with the next thing and it costs with huge amounts. So these things don't happen overnight. Now, the, the, the latest one that came on, online is your ivermectins, which is a clear, sort of a watery, but a transparent, clear ones. A lot of these um, oral drenches are uh, in groups, in families, um, and they sort of color-coded them. You get your, your, your uh, um, blue drenches, your pink drenches, your white drenches, and your clear drenches, and so on. So they're different uh, families. And when you're drenching, um, to, to, to stop this uh, 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 worms becoming resistant to the drenches and so on, if you keep on hitting them on the side on the same side every time, they get they get used to it. But if you hit them that side and you hit them that side and you hit them, and you hit them at the top and the bottom and so on, they don't know where to. You need to change the drenches and that will delay resistance happening and so on. But even the, the, the latest kit on the block, there are already huge uh, um, uh, areas that are um, resistant to it and so on. So we've got a, we, we, are, we are under threat um, and so on. And um, the, the pro guys, the, the problem is <clears throat> we are fighting this battle in the yards. We, we bring them into the yards, we put them in a race, we drench them, uh, we put a, 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 a the oral drench uh, in their mouth, uh, in their throat, and so on. The problem is that the battle that we're fighting in the yards is there's only 15% of the worm population in the sheep at any one time. The other 85% are living in the pastures, and so on. They live in the uh, sort of two centi <coughs> sorry, uh, sort of uh, the larvae sort of live in the bottom two centimeters of a pasture and or one centimeter under the ground. So they live close to the ground uh, and so on, but they live in the pasture, on, uh, in the land. So we can kill all the worms in the stock. As soon as they, you put them out the gate, they pick it up again. So you know, it's incredibly hard to win this battle and, and so on. Because you know, the enemy that we're fighting you know, has got so many reserves um, that, can, that can replace them and so on. Um, and and it's, uh, it's not farms uh, that become uh, um, resistant and so on. It is the worms. Because what's happening is that when you drench, you kill about 80 or 90% of the worms. But the ones you did not kill are, of course, the parents, the breeding stock for the next generation. So if you keep on using the same drench, very soon you've got a resistance to that drench and it doesn't work anymore and so on. So uh, and the problem is, guys, we in Africa, but we don't have the 2,000 or 5,000 or 10,000 sheep like they do in New Zealand and Australia and so on. So when we buy a five-liter oral drench, it takes us a year to use the damn thing up, and they cost a fortune. But uh, some of these oral drenches, uh, a five-liter can cost you 800 New Zealand dollars, which is 6,000 pula, and so on. So they're incredibly expensive. And of course, you're not going to buy a different one also and spend the same amount of money and it's going to take you two, three years to use both up and so on. So that people keep on using the same thing and then they, they get to a stage where it doesn't work anymore uh, and so on. The other, thing, other problem with, with this fight against worms is that you can't give people a recipe. Say that in January you do this, you drench them with that, in February you do that and so on. Because there's too many variables, the, the climate, the, um, the soil conditions, the um, rainfall, uh, the microclimate. With, I might be on top of a hill or high ground and you might be in the low ground. So you've got water standing, you've got a lot of uh, 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 liver flukes and so on. So that even from me to my neighbor, the, there's different situations which needs a different approach. So we can't give you a recipe, but what we're going to try and do is give you some principles to follow. 
um, to, to win this battle uh, and so on. So yeah, the bad news is uh, the, the, the lack of knowledge and bad practices are tipping the scale in the enemies in the worm's favor um, and so on. And yet we are running out of ammunition to fight them with. But there are some lights at the end of the tunnel. So let's have a look at those. Um, okay, so guys, how does worms affect farmers? So it would cost them tens of thousands a year in drenches. This is sort of, I'm talking about one station uh, and so on. Yet in New Zealand, the station it can have 10,000 sheep. That's not a very big uh, sheep station in New Zealand and even a smaller one in Australia and so on. So yet on, on a normal, so 10,000 uh, New Zealand dollars and so on is 70,000 pula per year just on oral drenches and so on. But guys, I always say, it's the animals that do not die that cost you the most money. Because if something dies, you know something is wrong. And you do an autopsy and you go, oh, yeah, okay, yep, that, that's the fault. And then you sort it out, you drench or you, or you vaccinate or whatever, and you sort out the problem. So now the problem is gone. You've dealt with it. But if an animal does not die, but it grows slower, so you've got 5,000 sheep, each one of them growing 100 grams a day, less every day and so on so that's 500 kilos a day that you're losing in, in money wise so uh, and you don't know that you've got a problem so uh, it, it's the ones who do not die that cost you the most money and so on um so if you ask the average farmer how does worms why is it why are worms bad why does it affect the worms and so on okay they'll tell you yes it your wool farmer and so on they, they get daggy if they get uh, sort of runny poops and so on they get diarrhea from the worms and it dirties the wool and then the flies uh, come and they lay the eggs and the maggots start eating the the, the 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 rotten wool and then into the meat and so on so all of those and then they've got to shear them and it's a lot of work and cost money because they're paying shearers to do it uh, and so on other farmers will say yeah, it's, the worms are bad because they eat some of the food that the sheep should be getting and therefore they grow slower and so on. And the thing is, that is not how worms work and so on. So a lot of farmers misunderstand how uh, 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 worms affect the sheep. And after tonight, you will be one of the few that actually understand this and so on. So uh, uh, even the large numbers of worms even if you have 500 grams of worms, that's, that's sort of half a, 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 a margarine container full of worms. They only eat like a, a few hundred grams of nutrients that, from the sheep. So negligibly small amounts. It's not that they eat the food that the sheep should be eating, especially not barber's pole because they actually drink blood and so on. They, 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 sort of have a, a, a different effect to the other ones and so on. But this is how they, how they affect this, the, 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 <coughs> sorry, this, this, this sheep. Guys, when you, your body gets a pathogen, yet you get a, a cut and an um, infection incurs, when you've got a pathogen coming in there, your body goes into war mode. Yet you, you get an immune response. Your, body, your body's immune system response to a intruder alert okay so they, they make soldier cells they go and fight the battle they win the battle and then if they everything returns to normal and so on but guys when the body goes into uh, intruder alert or into immune response and so on everything else stops they all they, uh, the the soldier cells the white blood cells the macrophages and so on are huge protein cells and to make more of them, of course, needs a whole lot of protein. So that, that takes protein away from muscle growth, from reproduction, from all the other body functions and so on. So when the uh, when a, 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 a immune response happens, everything else grinds to a halt. It's a bit like in the, in the First World War, um, it, um, of course, Germany knew they were going to go into battle, so they built up a whole lot of tanks and jeeps and guns and so on. Um, of course, England sort of had idea, but they didn't know it was going to happen. So when the war started, with England was at a huge disadvantage in planes and tanks and so on. Um, but um, yet, over time, they sort of caught up. And then when they uh, uh, awoke the, the, the giant of America at Pearl Harbor, <coughs> America 
stopped making cars and they made jeeps and, and tanks yet overnight they changed their factories around and and within months the the roles were traversed and um <clears throat> sorry and and um uh, it was now germany that was outnumbered in, ta in in tanks and airplanes and so on so what i'm saying is when you're in more war mode all other things stop all your resources gets sent towards the fight uh, and so on now the thing with worms is how they affect the body is they trigger an immune response uh, and so on and that is how they stop or that's why they stop growth that's why the animals get uh, sickly stop growing uh, uh, and and so on um so <clears throat> um yeah, of course they, they they if they lose appetite they they uh, change their grazing behavior their tummies are sore their backs are uh, dirty uh, and, and so on uh, and of course you'll reduce reduce growth and so on so the so that that's that's how it works now sorry. now guys the animals that is most susceptible to worms are your young animals uh, young animals are born without any immune system. That's why we drench the ewes, the the sows, the cows to uh, with with vaccines, so that they build up immune uh, with antibodies. Then they give it to their calves and their lambs and their piglets through the colostrum. And so the, the first uh, few weeks uh, in, in piglets, sort of ten weeks in piglets, uh, up to sort of. Uh, uh, eight, nine, ten months in, in calves and so on, they are covered passively from the antibodies that they got from their mum until their own immune system starts working. So they, they basically got AIDS. They got no immunity when they're born um, and so on. So if, if your body is now going into an immune response, their, their immune system isn't developed yet and so on. So they are uh, at the, the, the biggest uh, risk of uh, with with uh, worms and so on um okay so the, the, the worms get established reproduce freely and the young stock becomes becomes the major source of pasture contamination because uh, so one of the good news is are that um adult sheep adult cattle and all adults uh, build up an immunity to worms which means that they do not get into this immune reaction they are still carrying it. The worms are still there, still doing the same thing. But the 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 the, the, uh, uh, the bodies of the adults have learned not to get alarmed by this, uh, and so on. Um, but the the adults are still dropping the worms and so on uh, as they go and so on. They just don't. Uh, yet the body has learned. Yet okay, yet that's that's yeah. There's an intruder, but uh, it's only worms. We don't have to go into war with them, uh, and so on. So your, your older ones are immune to it, except one un, when they are under stress. Now, pregnancy is stressful. Your ladies will, will attest to that. Um, my roommate from Vasti's mom said, giving birth is as easy as pulling your lip, pulling your lip right over your head <laughs> and so on. So when they're under stress, either through the bad nutrition, uh, through, through pregnancy, uh, bad weather, anything that uh, puts stress on them, then the worms start getting a foothold and, and start the body starts going into that immune response and so on. But usually, but on your adult sheep, um, it's not a problem. Keep them well fed, keep them warm, keep them and so on. And then the worms isn't the big problem uh, and so on. Uh, with, your, with your pregnant animals, um, usually uh, what you do is uh, before you put the ram out, you give them a long-acting drench. Some of these things can sort of cover them from worms for up to 57 days and so on. Then um, and yet you, can, you can do it. You can cover them during that uh, uh, dangerous uh, parts of pregnancy um, with long-acting drenches and so on. But your, worms, uh, your, your young stock are your biggest pr uh, problem and so on. <clears throat> um, so your, your, your adults only need to maintain energy and protein that they've already reached mature size they don't need more protein to build to grow muscle to get bigger uh, and so on so the protein especially protein 
isn't that big an issue for them. Of course, with lambs, yet they're still growing, muscle is, is protein, and, and they, they are at a much bigger risk, risk concern. Okay. Some good news. Yet, so we've, we've done the, the bad news and so on, some good news uh, and so on. Is we've got a few tools in our toolbox that we can deal with this. Um, the good news is that uh, these worms are very species specific. They only work on certain, on, on one species. The, the worms that infect sheep does not infect cattle. And the, the worms that infect cattle doesn't infect sheep and so on. So you can use sheep to clean up uh, worms of cattle and you can use cattle to clean up the worms uh, of sheep and so on. The bad news there is that sheep and goats carry the same uh, uh, um, worms. But with sheep, uh, llamas, uh, alpacas, uh, with all of these things, uh, have their own set of worms and so on. Um, but uh, so if you, um, so when when the sheep is dropping their worms, the little worms climb up the grass, waiting for a bus to come past. The next uh, uh, thing to eat it goes in, starts multiplying. So it's got sort of uh, reproductive phases, sort of different stages, and some of them. The egg, it's sort of egg drops out with the poo and onto the ground. Then it sort of hatches, it sort of goes through the first stage. Then this little thing, he starts moving and it's sort of burrowing in and, and so on. The second stage happens. Then it sort of gets bigger and then it starts climbing up the grass and waiting for the next one. So it's now in the third stage. Then the sheep, the next sheep eats it and so on. Now it's back into the sheep. Uh, and then uh, this thing starts, it matures, and then start you know, with feeding, and then start laying eggs, and the whole cycle goes again, uh, around again, and so on. But if you had pastures where sheep graze, and now these little worms are waiting for sheep to come past, you put some cattle in there, let the grass grow out. Cattle can't eat the short grass that uh, sheep can, because if you look at uh, how sheep eat, they remember they do not have teeth on their top gum. They only have teeth on the bottom jaw. So it's, it's a bit like tin foil. You know, a tin foil box has got that little razor at the, that when you open the lid, it's got that little razor and you pull the, uh, the tin foil out and you tear it off on that razor at the bottom. That's how sheep eat. They, they pinch the grass between their gum and this bottom teeth and then they rip it off and then they swallow it whole. They, 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 they don't chew when they eat, they go and lie in the tree and then they vomit it back into their mouth and they will do all of those things when we uh, do uh, the, 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 the feeding and so on. But anyway, cattle eat differently. Cattle need to wrap their tongue around it and then do the same thing. So they use their tongue. And now that if you take your hair and you try and sort of try and get your fingers around it and so on, if it's too short, you can't do that. So cattle can't eat as short uh, to the ground as uh, sheep and so on. So you need to let the grass grow out a bit, maybe do a seed rest, then eat the, the grass in, in the winter months, we sort of save it up as a, as a feed bank and so on. But um, you can clean up worm pastures with cattle. And then when you start, when you get to weaning, now those uh, uh, lambs are at weaning, they are under huge stress, so they're even more susceptible and so on you put them on a dirty pasture that where there's been sheep and so on they pick up all those bugs immediately they are hugely infected and so on but if you had cleaned that paddock up sort of you, uh, you, you, you uh, grew it out sort of late uh, late uh, summer uh, during winter you grated uh, you grazed it with cattle and of course now there's nothing left spring comes the grass comes out um, you, you save that paddock up for weaning then when you put your lambs in there it's clean. There's no larvae waiting for them to just jump in and, and infect them and so on. So you can do certain things to, to um, lessen the worm load and so on. <coughs> okay, we said, that, yeah, sheep and, and goats, uh, unfortunately, the worms does affect each other uh, and so on. And um, yeah, and we said that uh, uh, worm larvae are found in the first two centimeters above the ground and one centimeter into the soil. So they live in that just under the ground or just above the ground space uh, and so on. Yeah, and yeah, don't, don't, uh, when you're grazing and so on, when, we, when I went to university, one of the first lectures we had in pasture science, the lecturer took us out, the Free State University has these massive uh, set of, of um, 
uh, uh, glass uh, hothouses in front of the uh, agriculture faculty. And they gave us each a whole pile of little potting, uh, little pot plants and so on, with each with a Thermida triandra, which is a, a red grass um, plant in it. And they said, okay, for the next three months and so on, we're going to do this. Um, four of those we are going to uh, um, uh, uh, cut at two centimeters. And when you cut it, you take everything you cut off, you put it in this paper little bag, and you uh, write on it that this is week one uh, of the, the two centimeter cutting thing, and you put it in a, uh, in a uh, drying chamber. And at the end of the three months, you weigh how many kilos of grass you grew from that plant in three months um, when you cut it at two centimeters. Then you did the same. The next plant, you, you cut at four centimeters every time. The next one at eight centimeters. So we did all of that for three months. And guys, what, what uh, happened was that the grass that you cut at two centimeters every time grew about half tonnage wise of, of it. If you had a hectare full of it and so on, it would have been half the tonnage of the grass if you grazed it at four centimeters. And again, the same with uh, eight centimeters. So what I'm saying is if you want more grass, don't eat it into the ground. Leave some leaves for the grass to recover. Guys, uh, uh, if you see a tree, <clears throat> whatever you see above the ground, there are the same biomass under the ground. Now, you'll tell me uh, I've seen a tree blowing over and there's a few big stumps and so on. Uh, nowhere near as big as the stuff above the ground. That's not what I'm talking about. It's those millions of little roots that go and suck water off each uh, grain of sand that is uh, 10 meters in each direction and so on. They break off when the tree blows over and so on. They are the same biomass under the ground. Now, with the, with the grass, when you eat ha half or three quarters of the, uh, the leaves off, what it does is it, um, it, while it's growing, it's putting reserves in the roots as it's in the pantry. And so on. now you eat half of it. Now to grow the, the grass back and so on, it, it, it um, takes nutrients out of the roots and basically half the roots die to grow leaves again because it's using those nutrients to new, grow new grass. Now, if you keep on eating it down and it keeps on raiding the pantry, of course, eventually the pantry runs empty and then the plant dies. But if you graze it at, at sort of a half, uh, it's sort of 50 percent rate. There's, yes, you take 50% off, a little bit uh, of the roots uh, die back and so on, but there's enough leaves to recover quickly and start putting stuff back into the pantry, stop taking some things out and so on. And that's how, that, how it works and so on. Um, but yeah, yeah that, that's sort of uh, off, off, off the track a little bit and so on. Um, uh, where was I? Uh, yeah, so what I'm saying is, do not eat grass yet that low. You leave a little bit more, and it will give you a, a huge amount of extra food through the year by not eating it down to the ground. <clears throat> okay, so to, to effectively manage our, our worms and so on, we need to uh, uh, do, do more than just killing this, the worms inside the animals and so on. So uh, we should minimize the exposure to susceptible, of susceptible animals to the worms, which means that stop uh, feeding your lambs worm larvae and so on by cleaning the pasture, by grazing it with cattle, um, it, uh, seed rest and so on, wean them onto a clean pasture. So that's one way of doing it. The other thing is at crucial times, um, get, keep them indoors or get, where they don't get infected and so on. Now, in, in Europe, and where it's, it's, sort of, it's frozen half the year, and America and so on, they have big barns, and usually the stock is in barns. They are on slatted floors. In New Zealand, the same, uh, and, and yet the, the poos fall through. So there's no contamination from the poos. But of course, here in Africa, where you've got a kraal, the manure is sort of a foot deep from, from years of use. And of course, the lambs um, yet in the kraal is one of the, the big uh, contamination areas and so on. But um, yeah, if you can have a, a, a clean uh, crawl that's not used by animals and so on, um, and, and during crucial times, uh, uh, put them in there. Now, crucial times being um, uh, it, when they weaned, 
uh, and so on. And also uh, during lambing and so on to clean the, the mums out with drenches and so on before they lamb so they don't immediately infect the, the lambs and so on. Um, but yeah, and also then times when um, uh, that, that's crucial is, is your spring and your autumn, that when the grass are short, that in the uh, spring, that there's been nothing, everything has been grazed to the ground uh, during the winter and the dry months. Uh, as soon as the new grass uh, comes up, people, that the, everything is eating that green grass as it stick its, sticks its head out. And of course, on top of each one of those are, are um, uh, worm larvae. So your spring and your autumn um, is the, the high season for worms and so on. The other thing that you need to know is your, is your enemy. You need to know their life cycles. They, they've got different stages that happen in different places. It's some in the, so, in the, in the, in the soil, in the, in the dung that it gets deposited. Some happen inside the, in the ground. Some happen on the grass. Some happen in the, in the sheep when it's picked up again. So know each worm's life cycle. If you know your enemy, you can fight them better and so on. Use your drenches wisely. Use different family groups. But if you use the white drench this this month, um, next month use the the, the, the pink drench, and then the, the the blue one, and then the clear one type of thing. But they, they, uh, alternate your drench families and so on. Knock them from different uh, directions and so on. Now um, there's there's a new way of thinking about worms. Uh, there's been a, uh, quite a few new uh, um, ideas about worm fighting this worm problem and so on. Guys, for 10 years, I um, took, uh, I, I ran a, 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 a sheep and beef course um, at, uh, uh, in, in New Zealand and so on. I had 10 uh, students, mostly Maori students, young, young guys, sort of 18 to 25 years old. Um, we went, in a, we jumped in the mornings, we jumped in the van, uh, we went to a big station, we did crutching, we did uh, uh, shearing, we did... Uh, 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 drenching, we did vaccinations, we did all the, the practical work in the yards mostly. And um, guys, when you were drenching and a sheep got past you in the race, the farmer just about bit your ears off and so on. Get that sheep, go, don't let anything get past you and so on. Um, it, and and for, for years we, we did that. We, we did not, we drenched every single sheep. The new way of thinking is that you should leave a small percentage of undrenched sheep every time. The reason for that is if you keep on drenching and you're, uh, that you're building up resistance, so if you kill 90%, the 10% that's left is the parent stock of the next lot. If you keep on doing that, soon there is no more susceptible ones. <clears throat> and, it, and, and then you totally lost the battle. But if you have a small percentage of animals that's not drenched, who still has susceptible to that drench uh, uh, worms, then the population isn't totally uh, um, uh, immune to, to that drench and so on. Now, of course, you're not going to leave the dirty ones that is obviously a bit rotten with worms and so on. But if you, in every race and so on, we usually sort of put, put all the sheep in and sort of 20% of the sheep was usually sort of dirty at the back or had that sort of uh, telltale little uh, bag under the chin that you get from, from worms and so on. Um, of course, you're not going to leave those. You take the ones that's, that's not showing any signs. If they're already better adapted and so on. Leave some of them, leave 10% undrenched so that they keep the susceptible worms in the population and you haven't lost the battle completely yet. So that's called refugia. Uh, that is one uh, um, uh, way of doing it. Uh, sort of you, it's sort of using a, 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 a management tool um, to, to help with the worms. The other thing is, guys, and I've done that my whole life basically when I was uh, farming with sheep and so on, is... When I drench, if I drench today, I lock them up in the paddock that I'm going to plow, uh, that I uh, reseed, uh, that plant pastures or something in. I, uh, that I have this paddock where I, after I've drenched, I leave them overnight in this paddock so that they throw off the worms. Yet once I drench, the worms, yet some of them are just stunned, some are dead, some are dying, some have still got eggs and so on. But they, they become loose, they're not attached, they, they, uh, and so on. So I drop the worms in a paddock 
that is not i'm not going to put sheep in for a long time so it's sort of a depository for for worms and so on um, and i've i've always done that sort of leave them overnight there next day that they they've dropped all the poos from overnight and then you put them onto a, a clean pasture from from there on so you can use sort of organic or, or management tools to to fight this battle as well okay so we're going to start looking at uh, uh, different worms now they all got sort of almost unpronounceable uh, uh, latin names and so on we're going to stick to the sort of uh, with the common names um so the the first one we're looking at is barber's pole now you can see on this little picture over here oh sorry let me just maximize this for you sorry um so you, you can see in this uh, the, the red and white stripes and that's why it's called the barber's pole now this is quite a big worm uh, and so on it's quite visible uh, by eye this is a sort of three centimeters long um and they uh, so we need to know where where they, where they so th this worm drinks blood okay and the, the animal becomes anemic how do you know something is anemic even people you flip you, you you pop the eyelid over like this and it should be pink in there not white and so on when you get anemic and so on whether you've got jaundice or any other reason and so on then um your eyelids on the inside your your mucous membranes becomes very pale uh, and so on so that that's one thing that you can look at the other telltale uh, uh, sign for for why for for barber's pole is see it looks like he's got a like a bit of sack hanging under his jaw and so on that is a, a, another telltale sign of um, barber's pole the other thing is um so uh, um is uh, this is the 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 last stomach the true stomach the the uh, abomasum now we said oh well, no, sorry we haven't said that yet uh, when we get to the digestive system and so on we'll talk about this uh, uh, last stomach and so on this is a very thin little stomach lining and in that stomach it's got acids like hydrochloric acids they say the acid in a dog stomach is so strong it can eat a hole through a brick uh, and so on so but these acids being formed and those acids are there to to kill bacteria pathogens that come in with the food also gives you a, a acidic medium to digest protein and so on but anyway in that stomach what protects the stomach from the acids is a thick mucus layer and so on now this is that stomach um, if you scrape that you'll see that it's sort of got this thick slime on it but you can see with the naked eye the worms so if you clean if you kill your, your animal uh, if you're slaughtering an animal to to get for for the meat and so on clean it get empty the pawns out get, drop the grass the grass out look on the inside of the stomach lining if you see these little red and white stripy worms is sort of three centimeters long that is barber's pole and again you, you you need to know where to find them so they've got this like a syringe that they stick into the stomach lining into a, a blood vessel and they gobble up a lot of the blood um, of the animal and so on and that's why they become anemic <clears throat> okay so let's let's look at, at the life cycle and, and so on so it's got your different phases so firstly the sheep picks up the the, the 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 larvae and so on it sort of matures in the in the sheep then eventually that adult worm uh, lays eggs and of course that's dropped out now with with in the dung and so on the next thing that happens is the, that the infective larvae migrate into the soil so these things the, the egg hatch in the soil the larvae migrate um, into the the, uh, the the plants above into the grass and so on sort of two centimeters up the little grass stems and so on wait for the next bus to come around the next sheep to eat it and the whole process start uh, over again so the the, uh, the 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 larvae so this is the egg the larvae uh, uh, the, the, the dung the, in the dung pack in the dung in the, the sheep poo and so on the larvae hatch from the egg and go into two molds to become an infective larvae so the, the the egg hatches larvae stage one and two happens in the dung then when it molts and so on become uh, level three larvae then that thing starts climbing up the grass uh, sits there waiting for the next bus uh, when the, the sheep eats it that larvae uh, thing uh, um, larvae 
uh, molts again into larvae four stage, um, which is an immature uh, uh, worm, and then finally uh, matures into an adult worm, which starts laying eggs and the whole thing goes up again and so on. So it's got these different stages and they live in different areas uh, during those different stages. But uh, yeah, I'll answer uh, questions at the end. Do put them in, in, the, in the little chat box there and so on. Um, yeah, so we've, we've sort of spoken about this yeah, in the picture and so on. And yeah, I said to you, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, post these um, PowerPoints for you and so on. But here's the important uh, bit, guys. The adult female barbus pole lay up to 10,000 uh, eggs uh, per female per day. So you can see that early spring and autumn, yeah, these things can multiply overnight. Yeah, if each worm lays 10,000 eggs and each one of them hatches and so on, immediately you've got a massive problem and so on. Um, and, yeah, so that, that sort of, those uh, eggs then sort of go through the cycle and of course then you've got 10,000 females uh, yeah, sort of a few days later uh, and so on. Um, under favorable conditions, uh, which is yet warm, yet not, not frost, not uh, um, dry, and so on, yet in spring and autumn, you still got a bit of moisture, or you start getting moisture, hot, humid conditions, and so on. Those are favorable conditions for worms, uh, and so on. Their life cycle from, from yet an egg to an adult can be 21 days, three weeks. Now, that three weeks, You'll see later when we start drenching and we're sort of talking about drenching uh, regularly and so on, we are, that if you allow that egg to become an adult and lay eggs, then your, your, your problem just carries on and on and on and on. But if you can uh, break the cycle, if you can kill them before they start laying eggs, then you can get on top of this game and so on. So if you, you'll, you'll see where this 21 days come into play uh, but down the track and so on. Of course, they live in the abomasum, the fourth stomach, the true stomach, uh, which you'll, you'll uh, learn about during the digestive uh, or the, the feeding uh, um, part of the of the course. They are twenty, uh, sort of two to three centimeters in size. A thousand worms drink fifty mils of blood per day. Now, fifty mils, um, you know those those um, syringes and so on. The big syringe is twenty mils. So two and a half of those, that's, that's, that's most probably half that mug uh, worth of blood that, that um, uh, that's a thousand worms drink and so on. The lambs uh, uh, dies from anemia or oxygen starvation. Uh, if they haven't got, uh, um, if their blood is being drinker, drinker, drink, drunk and so on, then of course they can't carry oxygen and they're basically di dying from oxygen, oxygen starvation and so on. Um, now we are going to look at how to score to tell us, do we need to drench now urgently or can we wait another week or two? Because if you just drench it monthly or three weekly it regularly, you will always have to do that. But if you can delay, it, let's say the, the conditions isn't 100% favorable for them, you might be able to wait another week or two before you drench. And in a year, that means you could maybe save yourself, instead of drinking, uh, sort of drenching every three weeks, um, it's, it's three and 52 is um, about 14, 15 times, you could maybe save five times. And, and in money, that is thousands of, of pull-up worth of drench that you're saving. If you drench just when they need it. So we are going to look at, so this FEC uh, stands for uh, fecal egg count. So what you do is you take fresh poo and sometimes you put your finger up the arsehole and you get some fresh poo before it's even come out because as soon as it touches the ground, then it might get contaminated from worms that is already on the ground. So you want fresh poo and then you add some water and you look under the microscope and you count the the eggs within the, the microscope, the little platelet has got little um, uh, little squares on it. You don't have to count all the eggs. You count how much is in one little square, and then you multiply it by the squares and it tells you how many eggs. Anyway, a fecal egg count. That's one way. And then there's a, a, a sort of a score chart that uses the color of the eyelid to tell you how bad the worms are. 
whether you need to do it urgently, wait another week, or, or so on. So we're going to look at those things as well. Okay, so yeah, the same thing, level three and so on. Uh, from the egg to level three uh, is sort of three and a half days from uh, the level three eggs to the, uh, uh, and so on. Once the level threes are leaving the feces and so on, that's sort of 19 to 21 days. The complete cycle sort of 24 to 25 days. And um, it's the, the important thing here, guys, is that your barber's pole worms are uh, in their level three stage. When they are sitting here at the bottom of the grass, they are quite tolerant to cold. A lot of these worms don't survive frosts and so on. Now, in New Zealand, um, it's cold. Yes, it's always cold, but there's not a lot of frost. Okay, it snows sometimes and so on, but New Zealand produces a massive amount of grass because it's temperate. It's, uh, it's not too hot, it's not too cold, it's always wet, <laughs> or mostly, relatively, uh, and so on. So it grows a shitload of grass. Um, but they don't, don't have a lot of frost, and they don't have a lot of dry. So that helps us in, in, in Africa and, and so on, in Botswana, um, because worms do not like dry and they do not like freezing conditions. But this worm, uh, barber's pole, does. So when the other worms sort of gets knocked by, by your first frost and so on, barber's pole aren't. And when they can lay 10,000 eggs a day and so on, uh, this is the time when they say, yes, no more competition, and they just take over the whole uh, show and, and have a party, and so on. <clears throat> okay, so this uh, uh, scoring uh, method and so on, you can see they, they sort of flip the, the eyelid uh, and so on, and then they say, okay, is that color there? Is it that one? Uh, it, it's, that one is lighter, so it's not that one. And it's not that dark and so on. So, yeah, the closest one is that one. And then that gives you a score and it tells you, yep, you need to do it right now or wait another week or so. So that's the, the scoring system that um, you can use um, to, to um, tell you where you need to uh, um, drench or not. So it's basically involving the, the regular examination of the animal's mucous membranes, the, the best one to work with or the most accessible one it in a race and so on when you've got a few hundred sheep and so on is um, is the eyelids and so on because it's all you don't have to bend to the ground and, and so on um, and, and you do this mostly in, in the uh, summer months and so on when um, it, when these things it, when the conditions are favorable when it starts raining there's new grass growth and all of those kind of things um, uh, with training this uh, technique is fairly simple to master um, and so on uh, yeah, so you just, you've got a chart, you've got a color chart, and you match it there. Um, so so when, it, when it becomes too pale, you sort of say that's, that's, that's normal. When it gets too pale and so on, then um, uh, you, you need, animals need to be uh, individually marked uh, and treated and so on. So you don't even have to treat all the animals. You can go through them and say, okay, yeah, those ones are... Yeah, uh, are pale and so on, we need to treat them and not the other ones. This way you can save yourself a huge amount of drench and so on. But if you just drench everything every three weeks and so on, it's going to cost you a fortune in drench uh, over a year and so on, especially when you've got 500,000. Guys, guys, just uh, mute your, your uh, microphones, please. Um, we, I, I will answer the question. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Um, uh, sorry, so we are we. Uh, okay, so once a percentage of the herd that is sort of anemic it gets too big, then you treat, of course, the whole herd and so on. But if it's just a few, you can treat them and save yourself some money. Okay, fecal egg count. And so on. The most common method used to, to, to determine the presence of and the degree of, of uh, worms and so on is to, to count the eggs in the dung and so on. So, firstly, you've got to get fresh poo. And as I said, you put a glove on, you stick your finger up the ass, and you get some fresh poo right out from the source uh, and so on. Um, so, it's usually this uh, 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 and so on. Uh, 
it's sort of usually in, in the summer months when the when the rainfall is, is there and so on um but um so we, we'll talk about so you, you need a certain weight of poo and you need a certain volume of water and you mix it then you strain it through that you keep the, the solids out and so it's just the water then you take a little droplet you put it on a little glass plate then you put a, another little glass plate over it and so on so now it squashes that droplet flat and so on and then you can see that little a glass plate has got these little um, calibrations on it and so with that you count the eggs and so on now some of these so this is what it looks like under the microscope and so on some of these things are pieces of grass some other uh, insects and so on so you need to know which ones are actually worms to, to count them accurately and so on now if you uh, don't well if you if you were taught this and you you've got a micro uh, microscope and so on you can do this on the farm new zealand most farmers do this and so on but you can uh, take the sample um, and take it to the vets and so on of course don't ride around with it in your car for for a week before you do and so on get it to the vet as as quick and and, and so on as possible do not let it dry out before it gets to the vet and so on of course then the, the, the things will die as well so you get the, a fresh as possible sample to the vet and he'll do the rest and tell you yep your, your egg count is too much you need to uh, drench right now okay now when this animal is already anemic and so on they are uh, yet you can treat it so with that the, the, the egg count is to prevent drenching and so on but when they already uh, anemic and so on uh, there's a few uh, uh, things that you can do um, uh, yeah so so it's uh, so certain drenches are contact act, uh, 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 active and so on um, so they, they kill the, 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 the worms and the eggs on contact uh, and so on uh, especially your, your sort of your, your contact uh, uh, drenches are, things are your uh, um, uh, Levamizols, uh, 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 yes, the bloody things you can't pronounce and so on. Uh, but yeah, you'll see that name on uh, with different drenches and so on. Um, okay, so and, and you need to change them. I showed you that bottle, bottle jaw, that sac that forms under the, the, the jaw and so on. So you need to treat them until those bottle jaws are completely gone uh, and so on. Um, and Remember always to take a dung sample from a, from a treated animals to be analyzed again, um, it, preferably the same animal sort of 10 days later to see whether the, the drug actually worked. If you, you, you treat it, you, you, you found that yep, you need treating um, and you have it analyzed and so on, it, it says, yep, you've got to treat it, test it again 10, 10 days later and see if it worked. If, of course, if it doesn't, it means you've already got uh, um, uh, the, or the worms have got immunity to that drug and you need to change your drugs and so on. Um, supportive treatments and so on is giving vitamin B, cobalt and, and, and so on. These things are uh, to help or is, is vital in, in forming blood and so on and it recovers the, the re recovery of the animal and so on. The animal that's not anemic uh, and the, the, uh, if the dung count goes above uh, 1,500 eggs uh, uh, per gram and so on, and the, the conditions are favorable, it, it's rainy, it's hot, uh, um, it's grazing on, on planted pastures, persistent grazing, heavy uh, pregnant ewes and lambs and so on, uh, you can expect a, a drastic increase in infestation and so on. So when you've got sort of over 1,500 eggs and, a, and favorable conditions and so on, you can make yourself ready for, for a huge infestation and so on. Um, then you would you'd sort of think about treating the whole herd instead of just the ones that sort of got a pale uh, eye color and so on. Um, and um, yeah, then you would consider doing the whole herd instead of individuals and so on. Um, and yeah, again, uh, take samples again 10 days later to to make sure that the drug has actually worked okay so factors that may affect the effectiveness of the drug is anemia if the animal is already anemic then of course the the, the drug 
won't work as as well as as to prevent it and so on. If it's already there, um, it, it, it's uh, fighting a losing battle and so on. Um, in co uh, this is this is one of the biggest things that cause uh, um, the worm resistance is incorrect dose applications, guys. When we went to drench, if we went out to a farm to drench animals and so on, we would put a race of animals in New Zealand. Every farmer at the front of the race has got a scale. Um, and we would raise, uh, uh, say we're going to drench 2,500 lambs. We would, uh, uh, a, a drench race will take sort of 25, 30 sheep. We would weigh the, that 30 sheep, get an average weight, and then we will work out our dose rate on that average weight. That's one way of doing it. The better way of doing it is to drench to the heaviest animal. Now, that's going to cost you a little bit more, but it means that you're going to kill all the worms of all the animals. If you just go into the middle, that means that half of the animals you are under drenching. And that is a sure way. Now you're not just killing, you're not killing 90% of the worms, you're killing 50% of the worms. So the, the immunity against that drug is built up so much quicker. So uh, uh, incorrect dosing is um, a huge problem in worldwide and so on. But if you think you're going to save money by just sort of going to the middle and so on, um, you, you are just uh, delaying the inevitable and so on. Uh, um, so estimating weight in, uh, uh, wrong can uh, go that result either underdosing or overdosing. Not overdose. Animals don't die when you give them too much drench. But they, they, they don't kill the worms when you give them too little of the drench and so on. Um, if animals in the herd are, are reasonably uniform, you can, weigh, you can use the, the weight of the heaviest sheep and so on. If the animals aren't uniform, if there's big ones and small ones in the same herd and so on, sort them by mass. You sort of get all the biggest ones together, the medium ones and the smallest ones. Um, New Zealand, again, at the front of the race, you've got a drafting gate. The animals run at flat out speed and the guy in front uh, drafts them into th three different uh, groups and so on, light, mediums and, and heavies. And then, you, then you've got a, a reasonably uniform group that you can drench um, all of them in that group at the same rate. Um, other thing is uh, your applicators and so on needs to be set and, and uh, tested. Now, most, most guys sort of got a plastic, that these um, drenches usually come with a plastic drench gun. So you've got a, a, a sack on the back where you put it in. It's got a pipe to a, a, with a handheld thingy and so on. But these things are plastic and they wear out and they are not very accurate and so on. So before you start, take a measuring cup. And if you decide, okay, that if you, your dose rate is at five mils per sheep, do fifty? Sort of do ten squirts in this cup, and there should be fifty mils in 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 the cup. If there's only thirty mils, it means that your drench gun isn't very accurate, and so on. Get another one. Um, a, a better system is to go and get a uh, go and buy a proper drench gun made out of metal, and so on. You get sort of kit sets that uh, replaces the rubbers and so on in it, so it's always working perfectly. The other thing is when you finish drenching, guys, clean it out. Triple rinse it. Clean it out. Uh, leave it open, leave, leave it hanging upside down so it dries out and so on. Don't put it in the sun because the sun de de deteriorates the rubbers in your um, in that kit set and so on. But let, look after your your uh, um, applicators and so on, so that you can so you can apply the correct dose rate and so on. Um, yeah, so clean it every time uh, and before starting uh, to to uh, dosing and so on, um, measure it and so on. The other thing is that um, sometimes, so these things work, you, you, you squirt it, and then it's got a non-return valve, which means when you let the gun go, uh, it stops air coming in, but it sucks, air, it sucks liquid from the bag on your back and so on. But when, when these non-return valves don't work properly, when you let it go, instead of sucking liquid in from the, from the drench, uh, from the backpack, it's sucking air in from the front. So what you're doing is you're squirting sort of half, as, uh, uh, half the amount of liquids and the rest is just air that you're putting in its mouth. And um, that when you've done uh, that 2,000 sheep and you say, oh, geez, this backpack should have been empty and it's only half, 
then you're in big trouble. Then you've got to do 2,000 sheep again. That's happened to many an experienced farmer. <laughs> a good friend of mine said that when he was a young shepherd and so on, worked on a big station, and uh, he was told to drench sort of 5,000 sheep, and so he got them in, and he drenched them, drenched and drenched, and when he finished, he found out, oh, shit, this, it, the backpack is still full, and he had to do them again. So uh, he, he never lived that one down and so on, but it happens to the best of us. Guys, uh, another thing, when you've got these backpacks, some of them you put upside down. So there's no pipe inside, so the, the, the liquid goes out the bottom. So, of course, the backpack has to be carried on your back upside down. Uh, then the, it goes down the pipe to your drench gun. Other uh, systems work where you, your backpack is upright, but it's got a tube down the middle. So those ones you, you carry with the, with the nozzle at the top. And yeah, many a guys have, have done that wrong and, and um, it drains a whole lot of sheep and that to do it all over again. Okay, so we spoke about uh, refugia and so on, leaving some out. And of course, we not not the worst ones and so on, um, um, but leave some out. So there's always some not resistant worms in the population and so on. Uh, da -da -da. Cover those. Okay, so uh, there's um, uh, uh, to, to, uh, there's a there's a five point check um, for uh, so targeting selective treatment uh, and so on, uh, and to sort of get a threshold of where do you need to work or, or where do you have to treat and where can you wait a bit and so on. So the first check is the eye. So you look at the mucous membrane, uh, me membrane, you look at the color and you compare it to the card and so on. There's a scale of one to five. Um, treat if it goes to three or f over three and so on, pale. So that's uh, it on that um, uh, the, the bottom three of those five colors. When it's, uh, when it's sort of uh, two or three, then you don't need to treat. But the, the threshold is um, three to five, then do, do treat. Possible infection uh, with, with pale uh, and so on is the blood sucking one, which is hemorrhoid, uh, 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 the, the, the barber's pole. Just these damn names you can't pronounce. So the barber's pole who drinks blood is the one that causes this um, uh, um, paleness and, and uh, anemia and so on. The jaw, bottle jaw and so on, sub mandula, mandula is your jawbone, under, so sub is under, the jawbone, oedema is a swelling. So that that little bag under the, under the chin. So you've checked the eye, then you uh, check the uh, under the jaw and so on. Um, if it's a, a, a zero or a one, treat uh, if it's present and so on. If it's got a bag, treat it basically. Um, so it's either yes, it's there or not. If it's there, you treat it and so on. Um, then the next thing you check on the back uh, and so on, uh, a body condition score. So animals who are thin uh, it, it will tell you that, yes, they've got worms and so on, or it's very really likely that they have worms. And, or if they haven't got worms, they will get it because the condition uh, it, is stressful and the worms will, will just jump on it and so on. So um, on a scale of one to five, if it's two or less out of five, then you, if it's thin, you need to uh, treat it and so on. Then there's a whole range of these uh, uh, worms uh, that that um, uh, come into play and so on we'll go through with most of these worms uh, tonight as well uh, tail so you, you check the eye you've checked the, the, the jaw and so on um, you've checked the back now we're checking the tail <coughs> dags or diarrhea uh, around the back sort of on a scale of one to four um, if it's more than two if it's more than it halfway then you treat it and so on. And the same, these, all of these are coming into play when, um, when there's a lot of poos around the back end and so on. Okay, um, limitations, so, it's, so with, uh, with goats and so on, basically the same. We said the same worms attack the, the, um, the goats as it does for the sheep and so on. Um, now, Apart from the, the roundworms and so on, you also got this nasal bot. Now, this is a, a terrible thing. These larvae are as big as the, the, the last segment of my finger. Huge things. 
Um, and they are carried by a tiny little fly. This little fly only flies a few meters. It doesn't go far from sheep and so on. And um, so it lays its egg there. Then the egg sort of uh, uh, moves and it climbs in there and, uh, and it overwinters here. So it survives the cold of the winter. The fly can't survive. So it lays its eggs and now the babies, uh, they get bigger and bigger and bigger until they fill that whole nasal cavity up. And, the, and that is why you check the nose because it gets snotty um, and so on. It will uh, sneeze and cough and so on. Imagine, yeah, imagine a big fat bloody uh, larvae in your nasal cavity and so on. It must be incredibly irritating. The good news is that if you drench them just before winter when you, when you get frosts and so on, then you, if you kill them in the winter or just at the beginning of the winter there, then you can eliminate them from your farm because these things die during the winter. The only way they can overwinter is in the nasal cavity. If you treat the sheep there in the beginning of winter, it's cleaned out and you get rid of the nasal bot completely and so on. But yeah, just imagine the, 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 the irritation that thing would have uh, it for sheep and so on. Um, mostly these things you don't get, you think it's uh, that you hear a sheep snort or, or, or cough and so on, you just think, yeah, it's dusty in the yards and so on. So it often goes unnoticed and so on. Um, the, the sheep may show dis disturbed behavior and so on, yet, uh, trying to dodge this fly just like when you've got a fly wanting to sit on you and you, you, you keep on kicking it and blowing it away sheep tried to, to av av avoid the flies and so on so they sort of disturbed behavior um the sheep may congregate in shadow uh, in shadows and so on where the flies are less active these flies like nice sunny hot weather so they're less active in in the shade so you can see that sheep sort of go and hide in the shade to to, to get away from the flies um, and so on, which affect their grazing patterns. But usually, sheep graze it from the, just when it starts getting light. They are out there grazing, and they they graze sort of the two, three, four hours until sort of nine o'clock when it gets hot. Then they go and lie in the sun, and then they vomit that food that they've gathered and vomited back in their mouth. And now they regurgitate it. They vomit it, chew it, swallow. Next lot, vomit, chew, swallow. They they reckon. Uh, sheep chew one piece of grass more than 30 times. Now, if you take a, a lolly or a sweet, you put it in your mouth and you chew, you count 30 times. That is that is quite a bit of chewing going on and so on. So then they lay in the shade until sort of 4 o'clock when it starts getting cool again in summer, and then they sort of graze until 7 o'clock at night. But during the middle of the day, they are usually uh, in the shade and so on. So with, with this nasal bot, you will find them there it all day long they'll eat they'll eat less and spend more time in the shade and so on where they try and get away from these little flies um, you'll see discharge from the nose and so on sneezing coughing coughing difficult breathing and so on nasal discharge and so on uh, uh, can be smelly it's thick it's like really when you've got a bad cold that thick snot uh, coming out their nose and so on um, the, uh, so, it, uh, of course, if you can't smell properly and so on, that's a, a, a major disadvantage for rams during mating time and so on. Because they, they uh, with, luckily with sheep, the ewes come to the rams. Uh, goats, the rams follow the females, male, in humans, again, the males follow the, the females and so on. But in sheep, the, the women come to the guy and so on. But if then, it sees her say, hey, 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 I'm ready for you, and so on. Then she pisses little bits, he puts his nose in there, then he does that. It's called his Fleming, uh, and so on. There's the German guy who named that sort of behavior, and so on. But what, what they're doing is they, they're sucking air from the piss and so on that they put their nose into um, to try and detect pheromones and hormones, uh, it's sort of uh, um, volatile hormones, um, to see whether she's on heat. Of course, he's got a snotty nose. He can't do that, and that uh, affects your, his mating and so on as well. Um, and yeah, and then your, your female smells her lamb and so on. It, they, the, the way they 
identify their lamb is through smell. And if they can't smell properly, then they, they say, oh, it's not my lamb and walk away without it and so on. So these things can affect your reproduction quite severely. Okay, um, so th these flies uh, sort of peaks in the sp uh, spring and late summer when it's nice and hot, they like hot uh, and so on. Uh, when temperatures exceed 20 uh, and so on, you get your, your, your ma major activity and so on. Um, uh, the, the lifespan of this fly, the adult of this fly and so on, uh, is, is about two days in summer and f sorry, uh, uh, two days in summer and four weeks in colder weather um, and so on. The, the sea uh, nasal bot deposits a la larvae. The, actually, it deposits the larvae, not the eggs, in its host. Because remember, egg can't move. The larvae can move. It's it's mobile. So it lays it here in the nostril and it needs to climb into the nasal cavity. The fly doesn't go in there because the sheep would snort and it, it would go flying and so on. So it actually, the, 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 the eggs are already hatched when he puts it onto the, the, into the sheep's nose and so on. Um, then they, they grow and so on and they, as I said, they become as big as my, uh, the last digit of my small finger and so on. They are three centimeters long. So you, you, you think of a, a, a larvae or a maggot three centimeters long and sort of as thick as a pencil uh, and so on. They are substantial. I've seen some of them. So when you're drenched and so on, if you sort of got the sheep back in the yards, it's sort of three, four, five days later, then they start sneezing these things out or pieces of them out and so on. Sometimes, sometimes the whole thing. That's, that's how I saw one for the first time. And I thought, shit, imagine that thing in your nose and so on. It, it, it would be incredibly irritating and so on. Um, So, so they, 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 they survive in the, 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 the nose and so on for, for weeks and weeks through the coldest part of the year until it, uh, it gets warm again. Um, okay, uh, diagnosis and so on. Uh, there's no commercial available test and so on. You, you basically uh, either look for the little flies or treat it sort of uh, during the times where they, they are more um, likely to exist and so on. Um, they are much smaller than the common blowfly. Now, the blowfly, you get green ones, you know, those big, fat green ones. They look like a, it's like a shiny green. They call them uh, 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 green bottles, and then you get blue bottles. And they, they sort of a, a bluish color and so on, but all of them are big, fat uh, flies, not, not like a little common house fly. But these these little flies that carry the nasal bot are tiny little flies and so on. Um, <clears throat> so you look for the behavior, the snorting, the coughing, uh, it, uh, staying in the shade and so on. So th those are sort of things that tell you that you might have that problem or you how to diagnose the problem and so on. Snorting, stamping of the front feet, running in short bursts, trying to get away from this bloody little fly that's trying to lay its eggs in its nose and so on, burying their nose in the fleece of other sheep. So they stand and they put their nose against another sheep to, to try and stop the little bloody fly to, to sit there. Nasal discharge with snot, snotty noses and sneezing and so on. So that's how you diagnose it and so on. Treatment, um, there's a it, the, 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 um, macrocyclic uh, lactones. Uh, with uh, like ivermectin. So guys, ivermectin does internal and external parasites. Uh, it's inject you get the injectable, you do get a, a liquid, the oral one as well. The, 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 um, I actually just bought some today um, and I, because I felt that usually that's sort of a liter or 500 mils and this thing's cost a flipping arm and a leg. For 50 mils, I paid 600 and something pula and so on. Okay, it comes with its little syringe and so on, but still it's a shake lot of money. But um, you use um, one, uh, half a mole for sheep up to 25 kilos, um, one mole for sheep up to 50 kilos, uh, um, one and a half moles for sheep over 50 kilos and so on. So you do get a, a small amount of them, but it's still, it's costing you about five pula per milliliter. So if you've got a thousand sheep that weighs sort of 50 kilos, it's going to cost you 5,000 pula for treating them and so on. Um, yeah, 
Anything that's ending in TIN at the end, it's got, so ivermectin is the active ingredient. These other things are brand names. It is different companies name their, their product, different things. But what you need to look for in uh, when you buy medicine and, and drenches and so on is for the active ingredient. And ivermectin is the active ingredient and so on. So it's an injection. It, it does internal, external, cleans them out completely. The only thing it doesn't kill is some eggs and so on, but it kills all the adults of all the major worm species and so on. And it does worms and ticks and mites um, on the outside as well. Um, yeah, so it, of all of those, um, I would uh, definitely suggest the ivermectin as, as the, the best uh, one. Now the next, so we've, we've done the roundworms, we've done the, um, the, 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 the nasal bot. The next one is liver fluke. Now the liver fluke looks like a small little leaf. It's, it's sort of, you know, it's the size of a five, se five tebe uh, uh, coin and so on. Uh, it well worth, it well seeable by eye and so on, if, you know, if you're looking for it and so on. Now they live in wet, swampy area. So in New Zealand, of course, huge rainfall, you get a lot of wet areas and so on. Um, and so the, the adult fluke, fluke uh, resides in the bile ducts in the sheep and so on. So they live in the bile duct. Now the bile duct uh, puts bile into the small intestine. Of course, uh, it goes into the small intestine, then the eggs uh, uh, is passed out through the uh, feces and the, the urine and so on. Um, they can act, uh, the, the eggs hatch uh, in nine to 10 days under ideal conditions. It's, uh, when the temperatures again going 22 to 26. Now, in New Zealand, that only sort of happens in spring. Winter is much colder than that. And um, summer, it's usually too, well, it, it, it's even in uh, New Zealand, the summers are drier. So there's less standing water. So it's less of a problem. So spring and autumn again is the times when your liver fluke becomes a problem and so on. Um, then they, the, uh, 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 they they catch a ride in these small little snails that lives in the same standing water. Now these little things are one millimeter in size. So unless you sort of take your glasses and you go up close and so on, you might not even see them. If you just walk past, you don't look for them. You won't see them at all. So these things catch a lift on these, and they uh, they cl these uh, they they climb up the the um, the grass. Of course, then the sheep eat them and so on. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, these things are just sort of just in your wet, low-lying areas where it's, it's sort of uh, uh, standing water and so on. So what they do, uh, these are called liver flukes. So these flukes, are, once it's in the sheep and so on, they drill through the, um, the, the intestines and they, they drill into the liver. Now, if you ever saw a liver and it's got white stringy bits in the liver you try and cook it and it's got these white stringy bits or white spots it, uh, often you get the whole liver is there you haven't cut into it and so on it's, it's got these milk spots white spots the white spots are scar tissue so as this thing drills its way through the liver and so on it forms scar tissue behind it and the scar tissue is also sort of uh, um, strong elastic like these stringy bits and so on. So if you did cook it and you ate it, you had these white stringy bits in the liver, which uh, is gross, <laughs> you think about it. But yeah, they, they drill holes through the liver and it sort of shows as white spots on the top. Or if you cut it, you'll see holes and you'll see the, the adults. So this is a sheep's liver. So you get the sheep's liver the sort of this size, that, that thing diameter is sort of this size. And if you can you sort of imagine the size of this um, liver fluke, it's sort of like a small leaf and so on. Imagine that thing drilling through a liver and so on. That, that also can't be uh, fun and so on and so on. Uh, and, and it's one of the most uh, important parasitic diseases throughout the world, including in South Africa and, and okay, Botswana is a lot more sandy, a lot less standing water, but it, around your um, dams and, and so on, you will definitely find them as well. Uh, sw it swamps the delta, get up north, yes, definitely, this is a major uh, problem and so on. So it contamin contaminates the liver, so you can't, for me, 
the nicest part of a sheep is, is a lamb's fry. If people can prepare it properly. At university, I never went to breakfast in the morning. I stayed in the hostels and so on. Wednesday was lamb's fry. And every Wednesday, I was first in the, 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 the dining room. The, the, the ladies there could fry it. They fried it with sort of uh, fried onion and the liver. And it was just like, oh, man, it was just so good. My mom cooked it and it just tasted dry and uh, not the same. You need to know how to cook it and, and very few people do. But uh, if it's got white spots on it, do not eat it and so on. If you don't cook it properly and it's, uh, it's uh, still raw and so on, you, these things you can you can get as well and it does the same in your body. Uh, so it contaminates the liver. It can it eventually kill you if that thing is eating your liver up and so on. Reduces in uh, it's a reduction in milk and meat production. Secondary secondary bacterial infections. When, once it's causing a lot of wounds there, then any other bug can come in and infect it as well. Two two kinds of uh, uh, liver flukes found. You get the common uh, liver fluke. It's an average two and a half centimeters long and uh, one point five centimeters wide. Commonly found all over South Africa um, where conditions are suitable. And then you get the giant one, which is sort of five and a half centimeters long and one and a half centimeters wide. So this is a big, a big bastard like this. That, that's that's five, centimeter, five and a half centimeters. That is a big thing. Uh, mostly found in the northern regions of South Africa. And I'm sure that is the one that you'll find in the delta um, up Noun and, and um, in the Okavango Delta and so on, that areas. Um, life cycle is complex with several stages of growth, uh, both pasture and the sheep and the goats, cattle and so on. We had a look at the little fluke thing as well. Um, so if, to get the infection, you need to have a, a, a few things there. Firstly, you need the presence of freshwater snails, um, which is the intermediate host. It's a horse to ride around on. If it doesn't, if it, it's got another name for a host is, is the vector. So the vector is these little freshwater snails. If there's no snails, they can't get around. They're not a problem and so on. The presence of su suitably wet, marshy areas or ponds. The water must be slow moving or still. So if you're in a, in a running river, you won't get uh, uh, um, those snails. The rainfall helps to wash the eggs out of the feces and so on. <coughs> so that to, to, to get the, 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 the eggs into the water, you need rainfall to wash it there. That it, they can't walk. If the sheep poos two meters away from water, the snails can't get to the water unless rain comes and washes them there. Because at this stage, they are they're not larvae yet. They are just eggs. <coughs> Sorry. So it needs sort of a, a specific set of circumstances to become a problem. But uh, usually where you have standing water, you have a you bigger rainfall and all these things sort of fall into place after that. Um, temperature also plays a big role and so on. Um, both, uh, both flukes and snails survive uh, uh, over the uh, summer months of the year, um, sorry, thrive during the, the warmer months of the year. When the average day, the temperature goes below 10, the egg, uh, fluke, egg counts drop and so on, um, and the snails become inactive. So that their horses are stabled and they can't get around so much anymore. In the colder areas, the river fluke uh, life cycle becomes, comes to a halt over the winter periods. In the warmer areas, um, the temperature where the Temperatures are mild, if the, the life cycle continues throughout the year, um, but a little bit slower during the winter and so on. Now, tapeworms. Let me just see how we're doing for time here. Um, oh, bugger. Uh, let's just finish tapeworms and so on, guys. Now, here's an interesting story for you. Why does the Jews not eat pork? People think, yeah, because uh, the, 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 the bad uh, demons were put into the pigs and they ran over the cliff and so on. That's not the reason. Guys, tapeworm, uh, some, some part of its life lives in humans. The other part lives in, uh, there's different kinds. So the, some live in pigs. The, the other part of the year they, or time of their life cycle, they live in pigs. Some live in cattle. Some live in dogs and so on but they are very specific ones and they they look different they move different and and so on 
So uh, you, you um, the, the, the one is the, the the cattle one, and the other one is the the the, the uh, pig one, and so on. Um, but how does it get from the human to the pig in the human's poo? Now, it, in the Bible times, there weren't long drops and flush toilets and so on. So when you needed to go, you found a, a private spot behind a tree and you put your packet down there. And as soon as you got up, of course, along came the local pig and uh, came for a free meal. So if the pigs were infected from the human feces and so on, and the problem, guys, is that so this thing uh, uh, now, uh, so now it's in the pig. Then you eat the pig, and uh, if you don't cook it properly and so on, these blastocysts, which is basically the, the sort of uh, the, the start of it, the head, um, comes into your small intestine. It hooks there. Then these things drill through your stomach lining, and then they move around in your body. They drill uh, and so on. And sometimes they go and sit in your spine. And you are paralyzed. Sometimes they're going to sit in your brain and you go mad. So the people didn't know what caused this, but they knew that when they ate pork, shit happened. It, oh, funny symptoms happened when you ate pork. So they couldn't just say to everyone, yeah, okay, the guys, let's stop eating pork. So they just embedded it in their religion and say, yeah, pork is out, no more go, no, don't eat it, and so on. And they sorted the problem out. It, it, it came from a health problem and so on. Uh, but there's a, a difference. There's a, a difference between the cattle one and the pig one. Now, uh, the, the one one of them moves and falls out the 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 the, 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 the anus one by one. So you sort of feel a bit of itchy, you know, and there goes another segment. So these things are get huge rows of segments uh, stuck together. But one of those can make a new worm. And so on. Now, uh, with with the the, the pig one, uh, sorry, with the, the cattle one, these things break off one by one. They wriggle down. They fall out one by one. So they are spread far apart in the pasture and so on. So the contamination rate when a cow eats it, he eats one segment. So the contamination is lower. But the one that that affects uh, cattle and so on, um, uh, sorry, uh, pigs when you eat the pig one and so on. These things sort of uh, have longer strings. They don't move. So when you poo, you poo out a whole string. So when the pig eat it, they get a, a huge mouthful of, get a big contamination in one mouthful and so on. So it's a much bigger problem for humans uh, to eat, you know, to get it from pigs than from cattle and so on. So the cattle one moves, the pig one doesn't. This, the cattle one, uh, they so get uh, it climbs out one by one, and when they pick it up, they pick up one by one. The big uh, one doesn't move, drops out as a big chain, and um, they get a big mouthful at any one time, and so on. Now, of course, at the front, they use those hooks to attach in your small intestine, and um, it's, it's the, in, in, in Europe and so on, they actually use tapeworms as a, a diet measure they, they infect people with tapeworms so they can lose weight so the worm sort of get, eats some of the nutrients that and and, and so on uh, that's not an option i would ever take and so on but they do that um but yeah these things can block off the whole your your whole or the pigs or the uh, the cows whole intestine so food can't go past and so on but the, when you when you've got an infestation of that and you treat Get the whole balls looks like a, a, a ball of cotton wool. So the whole balls of this white. Uh, these things look like a shoestring, uh, and so on. They sort of two, three, four millimeters wide. Um, sort of one centimeter. They flat. They are flat worms. So there's only sort of two uh, millimeters uh, deep, and so on. But they're about four, five centimeters wide, and the, the segment, each segment, is sort of two centimeters in in length. But they, they come out as a string. They look like a ball of wool or a ball of shoestrings and so on. And they, they can be a huge, a huge problem for... And, and again, it's the biggest problem in small anim, in young animals. So with lambs and so on, 
your first drenches with sort of at weaning or sort of at, at uh, docking, which uh, is taking the tails off and castrating them and, and so on, taking them off the mum and so on. Again, they are now under stress. And that is the time that uh, the tapeworm really uh, is a problem. So your first drenches that you give to lambs definitely must have uh, uh, tapeworm drenches in it and so on. Later on, uh, the tapeworm with, uh, in adult sheep and, uh, and so on, it is not such a big thing. Now, the one that, uh, uh, that where the intermediate host is the dog. Um, and the thing is the dog carries it and he, his secondary host is the sheep and so on. And in New Zealand, farmers have lost millions of dollars with, um, with uh, tapeworm in their sheep. So in New Zealand, Every, okay, so every shepherd has got five or six or seven highly trained dogs. These things are incredible animals. They, they've got whistles. Each, each dog needs about five or six different whistles. One to tell him to go left, one to go right, one to stop, one to come closer, one to go away, and so on. So firstly, you, you need to be able to whistle. I can't whistle to save my life. And so on. Secondly, it is a sheep. The dog is a kilometer and a half of, uh, away from you. That even your whistling or shouting doesn't get there. So they use whistles uh, and so on. But uh, there was a guy uh, that we met on one of these stations. He was the national champion. When he went out in the morning shepherding, he had thirty dogs, thirty dogs, each with five different whistles. And this guy would drive on, on a quad bike with, with sort of with 10, 15 dogs in the back, and he would whistle, and one dog would jump off and race toward the sheep. And he would whistle and go around the right-hand side, stop at the back, start bringing the sheep towards him and so on. Then he'd give another whistle, and then that dog jumps out, and he goes that way, and he brings that mob of sheep and so on. These things are, oh, man, it's, it's, it's Go, go on YouTube and, and watch this type in New Zealand's sheepdog trials and things like this. These things are worth the most expensive animal on the farm. A, a trained dog, can you can pay 5,000 New Zealand dollars, 35,000 pula for one dog and so on. But anyway, so every month, on the first of the month, uh, the shepherds go to the vet. They buy a whole packet of tablets. So the tablets are sort of the size of a one pula a coin. But thicker and so on, a bit like these Lucozade uh, tablets and so on. And they, they feed it with, put it in a piece of meat, and his dog gets its uh, deworming and so on, so that they don't crap everywhere. The sheep eats it, uh, it goes into the sheep, and then um, the sheep, if they go to the abattoir. Now, when it's hanging on the hook there, there's a meat inspector in the abattoir. He doesn't work for the abattoir, he's an independent, and he works for the Ministry of Health. And he, test each carcass for tapeworm and what they do is they cut into the muscles that because these things concentrate in muscles that work the hardest so your hardest working muscles are your heart okay, you don't you, the heart is out by then already uh, the second one is the the legs but you don't want to cut into your most expensive cuts and so on so what they do is they cut into the jaw so they cut in there and you see this when when you when they have it it looks like Sago pudding, you know, this little uh, transparent little ball, sort of a jelly-like little ball, and so on. They have these things in the muscles on their jaw, and so on. Um, so that, and then they, they condemn the whole carcass. The carcass goes into a hole, uh, goes to a hammer mill, goes to a rendering plant. They dehydrate it, they heat it, they make meat and bone meal. The farmer gets very little for it, and so on. So it costs them a lot of money, and they decide that all shepherds will deworm their stock. Uh, if you sell a stock or you want to bring a dog onto a farm, you need to show that you are that the vet ticks a, a box. Yep, January, yes, he took his, uh, that he bought his, um, his, uh, uh, treat, that his worm treatments. February, yes, he bought it for 30 dogs and so on. Um, but um, one of my students wanted that he was going into shepherding. He, he sort of had a young dog that he was beginning to train. He, slipped it into the van i didn't even know if it was there we got to a farm and as we got out the farmer said put that dog back in the van he had to stay in the van the whole day he weren't allowed to even put a foot outside the van 
everywhere at the entrance gates says, do not bring your pet dog onto my farm because it can cost me thousands of kula that I'm spending shitloads of money deworming my own dogs. Just that you know, your friend comes with his Labrador and there it's, everything goes out the window. So tapeworm control is a massive thing in, in New Zealand because of the high rainfall. And I'm sure that uh, well, it, up in the Delta and things like that, it should it should be something like that as well. But yeah, mainly in young young stock and so on. Uh, but um, yeah, tapeworms are. Yeah, so he, sorry, he has the sheep and the and the dog one. So the uh, the, the the intermediate host and the uh, the definitive uh, definitive host is so in humans can be uh, in that cycle as well. But it uh, can happen between the dog and the sheep as well, and that can. So yeah, so when the vet cuts here yeah, into the jaw muscle and so on, this is what he sees. He sees these little bubbles, sort of like sago pudding, and uh, then he condemns the whole carcass. And yeah, he cuts in the jaw because that the head hangs with the carcass uh, because they that the head tells them how old the sheep is, which you can age sheep you know you can age sheep on on their teeth and so on so the head stays with the carcass and that is where the vet uh, or these veterinary technicians uh, cut to check for for me for, for measles and so on but yeah a, a big thing in new zealand yeah actually hydatus i don't even know if we've got that in, in botswana so i'm, I'm not going to go into that one um oh sorry just one more thing in new zealand um, every Friday, so I'm talking about the big stations. We had three, four, five thousand sheep, and so on. So there'd be one or two, two or three shepherds working on on these stations. Friday afternoons is making dog tuckers, which means that you've that all your shitty old thin ewes and so on, your two five year olds and so on, become dog food because you've got a shitload of dogs to food feed, and you, buying bags of food is cost expensive. So they feed these. Um, old sheep to the dog. So Friday afternoons after lunch is, is that every, all the shepherds get together in the killing shed. They usually have very good killing sheds and so on. They skin fire, they, 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 the, the, the old sheep. Uh, they cut them up for dog tuckers and so on. Then they put them in a deep freeze and they, they write on it the date that they put it in and so on. Now, a way to kill these things in the meat, uh, if it's there, is to freeze it. Well, one way is to cook it, but you don't often cook uh, your dog's meat and so on. The other way is to freeze it. So they put it in the fridge, and they so they know that with the new ones go on this side of the fridge, um, and then uh, you sort of work this way, and when you get there, then you start that side again. So you always take meat that is sort of at least five days in the deep freeze, which means it's frozen right into the bone. It meat, if you're putting five or six or seven new carcass in the, in the fridge and so on, it takes two or three days for that fridge to freeze the meat right into the bone to kill these um, uh, 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 larvae cysts and so on. So, um, yeah, uh, so they use freezing uh, to stop uh, giving contaminated meat to their dogs, and then they deworm the dogs once a month and so on. Okay, uh, guys, yeah, sorry, that took a bit longer than usual, uh, hour and 40 minutes. Um, yeah, so next next week, um, I can't remember what is next on the thing, but yeah, we'll work our way through the, the health problems and so on. Um, yeah, uh, so th this this slide actually uh, goes over two weeks, so I'll, as soon as I'm finished with it, I will post it um, as, a, as a material on, on Classroom and you, you'll have that as a, a resource uh, for future and so on. Guys, have a great week. Yeah, just... Thank God the, 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 the recording held, uh, I hope so, anyway, I didn't check all the time, but um, that, that's a miracle because the, the, the upload speed, which is the speed that I talked to you with, was very low when we started, so thank God for that one. Thank you, have a great week, and um, I'll see you same time, same place next week. Have a good one, guys.